were um, staying safe at home, we wanted to create programming for them. And so this was something that I thought would be a great idea to um, bring, bring amazing people into their homes and um, have conversations. So for all of you who are watching now, please remember to, um, that you can ask questions so you can write them in and, and uh, we can talk with, you can speak with our guests that way today. So I just want to just jump right in because there's so much to talk about. I am so excited for today's guest. Um, hold on, let me just. So I'm still trying to wait. I can hear myself. So I'm trying to. OK, there we go. All right. All this tech stuff. McCall is behind that J there. She's she's the, the Wizard of Oz back there for us. Yeah. And I'm the one who's like flubbing it all in front. <laughs> I'm good at that. Okay, so here, this is going to be such a great conversation today. I know it because this guy, man, this special person, the spiritual being who I had the fortune to run into at Whole Foods, of course, where else? Many years ago, I don't even know how many years ago, I've lost count. Uh, Paul Samuel Dolman. So he's our guest today. Uh, I'm just going to read about him, which could probably take up most of the whole thing because he's just like, well, I'm just gonna start reading about him. This is from his website, so you can go back and read about him. But here, we'll start with what Paul's passionate about. Paul is passionate about connecting on a soul level with other people, self-realization that applies to everyday living, finding wisdom in all things, caring about others and showing it, making a positive difference in the world, loving who or what is in, in front of me in the moment, that would be me and all of you out there. Um, being creative in a myriad of ways, challenging him himself to grow, shift and expand, embodying an integrated, healthy, balanced lifestyle, sharing with others and asking questions, spending quiet time in nature, noticing the wonder and mystery that surrounds us, consciously merging with source and being led, laughing, laughing and more laughing, which I hope that we'll get to do today, because I love to laugh and actually, which leads right into, I mean, one of his most highly su successful books, Hitchhiking with Larry David, talking about laughing, um, and which is a whole myriad of questions that will come from that alone, that discussion, I feel. He's written, I don't know, six books. You can interrupt me if you want to, Paul, but I'm gonna just keep going. He's written Hitchhiking with Larry David, Martha's Vineyard Miracles, Seven Crazy Days in Maui. I've read all of those. He has a podcast, What Matters Most, where he interviews, um, his episodes on his podcast include the arenas of spirituality, wisdom, relationship, humor, sports. He's interviewed some of the most thought-provoking leaders and individuals in our society. He travels and he gives talks on a variety of subjects. He's been a prof professional musician, piano and guitar. He founded an entertainment company, worked as a film producer in Hollywood. He currently divides his time between Martha's Vineyard and Anastasia Island. He's been the most loving um, person to his parents that I have ever witnessed and a real source of inspiration to me. And it all started because he offered me a piece of his cookie, which sounds like really like, like I don't even know what to take it where, where you're worth, but I have to say that that was the best half a cookie I ever had. <laughs> chocolate chip whole foods that's right yeah yeah, yeah. and that's that's how i met paul do you want to share my cookie <laughs> there's your laugh laugh of the day okay so 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 paul and i did not um like discuss like oh what are we discussing to we, we're just winging this thing but mm. i there's so much there's so many places to go and so i guess my first thing would be to you paul would be where would you like to take this you know the stage is yours today what where would you like to go with this conversation which is really about your life and your experience and and what you've learned along the way i think you know um is what i'd like to kind of hear but and i definitely want to hear hitchhiking with larry david because that in itself listen we got the jews the jewish population here in nashville all our seniors i'm sure like how did the heck did you meet larry david <laughs> well so why don't you just I don't know, start where you want, but you got to answer that at some point. I love it. And that's the greatest thing, introduction I've ever had. And I was listening to all that and I feel like I've had a great run and I'm kind of done. I don't know what to say after all that. It's sort of like, almost like one of those lifetime achievement awards that 
you know, you're all you're you're all set now, kid. You're done. And the stage is yours. The stage is mine. Thank you for having me on. And as you know, I spent many years living in Nashville. I used to go to the JCC. I love that place. So my heart is close to that town. It always feels like, even though I live in other places, I come back a lot. It's there's a magic there. The JCC was wow, what a facility. And of course, I am remembering that day we shared a cookie together. Give us this day our daily bread and cookies. And of course, we hit it off right away because you're so eloquent and friendly and full of love. And then, and I loved your art right away. I remember me coming to that apartment in Belmont and checking out your artwork and going, oh my God, you're really good. Do you remember that? Yeah. I don't remember you coming to my apartment. Seriously, how did I not remember that on Belmont? I love that apartment. I miss yeah, that. Yeah, that apartment. old place on Belmont. And oh I was like, God. whoa, you really are an artist. That w- Thank you. That was the most New York apartment in Nashville that I have ever lived in. And I wow. miss it to this yeah. day. Well, I would say here we are in the moment. It's July 7th, 2020. And in my brief time, rocketing through space on this rock. I don't think I've ever seen a more tumultuous, transformative time ever than the last few months between COVID, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement coming into its own, an election, a referendum really on who the country is. And all of this with climate change lurking in the background on the most beautiful place ever, this planet. And here we all are. And look at technology that allows us to connect, uh, have a podcast. It's called What Matters Most. I'm just about to air our 700th show. I don't know how that happened. I guess one at a time. And it goes out all over the world. I just got a note, a beautiful note from a woman from Australia. So you never know who's listening. You never, and I think on a metaphor, Oracle level and a literal level, we never know when we do what our heart tells us to do or create an act of love or a ripple of love, how far it'll go, maybe forever, and who it will touch. So that's continually something I need to remember. And, and you reading your beautiful intro has sort of reminded me of a lot of things. Some of them I probably needed to remember. So I would open it up. I love inquiry and dialogue. If you have any questions, if anyone's watching and listening, if they have to, you can ask anything, nothing's off limits. And I just love great exchange, authentic exchange, fun exchange. Me too. Yeah. So I'm just happy to be here and I'm honored uh, that you asked me to come on. I try to say yes to anything because the universe is constantly saying yes to me. And of course, having a show and we've a lot of people have been gracious enough to give their time and really their souls in that experience so i'm here and i am available to everybody out there so well thank you and we're all the better for it i might add um so i actually did have some questions and you 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 started to tread in that direction um, cause my first question, which would be a natural question would be, Hey, how are you? But I wrote these days, <laughs> how are you yeah. these days, which you immediately, you know, went into and, 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 and I know that could be a loaded question uh, with the current climate and how do you, you know, it's almost like, I feel, I don't want to say I'm, I feel on eggshells, but in certain ways I do feel on eggshells because I want to be not so much eggshells. I want to be mindful, really mindful how I, keep my mind open um, because politically our JCC is not a, poli- this is not a political conversation. So I'm going to stay, I want to stay uh, if at all, if that's even a possibility to stay neutral in a, in some way, because to not get into, um, because there are listeners who are from across all, you know, we have listeners that are just across all political, you know, realms. And um, so, I, so my question is, how are you these days? Which maybe you started to answer. And then that would might lead in how, that then that could lead into how do you navigate through what, well, I, I'm gonna say political minefields, personally, spiritually, physically, and by physically, I mean with positive action. How do you navigate in a way that's, well, to me it's open-mindedness, but it's even 
well, I'm curious to see how, how you navigate through life and take care of yourself and what you feel you're doing to help make, um, you know, go move, help move things into a way that is good for all of us. It seems people are so divided. It's like, what is all of us these days? Because people have very different ideas of what's good for them and what's good for somebody else. And it's, it's kind of mind blowing, so. Well, that's a great, great, great multi-layered question. And how am I right now? I'm fabulous. And it's interesting. I've come into this more and more lately to really be at the top of the food chain and have it made internally and, and in a lot of ways externally in a time. And there's always been like this on our earth where there's so much suffering and so many who lack the basics. Now, my suffering with them would not add any value to the world. So then I try, first I have to take care of myself or I'd quickly deplete and I wouldn't be much use to anything or anyone, I'd be compost. That would be short-term good for the uh, plants, but not maybe for the planet if I have a lot more I can give. So I try to take good care of myself. I did yoga this morning, I meditate, I, did, I have juice every day, I exercise. I try to move with great gratitude. I always think when I wake up, how fortunate I am to have hot water and clean water and food and friends like you and the opportunity to do something like this, like anyone would care what I might have to say for a few minutes. So in that, I wanna be really in a good place as possible. And then as I move through the world, I try to be friendly and loving and allowing, compassionate, empathetic. I don't wanna be neutral. I want to be for love and I don't think we should stay neutral. I think we should stay convicted for the better for all beings. And now that could look a lot of ways. And the way I navigate that minefield often, and I have people I meet all over the spectrum, uh, I'm very progressive, I won't hide that, but I actually know a lot of people who support all kinds of positions and I'm not adversarial, I'm more curious. Why do you feel that way? Why do you support this person? Why do you support this person? Do you know about this? Do you know about that? And so by listening and learning and building a connection, uh, I find that to, to be one, illuminating for myself. The other thing is I've really come into this, carry recently. I can't really hate or blame anybody for being who they are and where they are in the world because there were a million factors that led to that. Uh, no matter how heinous it might appear to my value system, that what life helped create that person who feels and thinks that way or might be so full of hate and anger. So I try to suspend the judgment and I'll say all that with healthy boundaries, but that's how I'm kind of trying to move through the world with a lot of curiosity, a lot of compassion, a lot of empathy. I do it imperfectly because I'm human. And I have to be very forgiving of myself and compassionate for myself because I am so human and flawed and imperfect. And that's the beauty of humanity. So in this time, I just try to be real, listen, not show up with a chip on my shoulder um, and be respectful. And so I'll use the thing about masks since that seems to be this great divide as among a million divides these days. I'm not a scientist. I'm not sure I know a bunch of scientists because of my show, a bunch of them I've been on. Does it help? Does it not? It seems like it does, but even if it didn't, to me, it's no great sacrifice in this unbelievable life I lead to wear one for five minutes in the post office or for five minutes at the deli where I get something to eat or at the grocery store. 99% of the day I'm outside, I'm in the ocean, I'm riding a bike, I was on a sailboat. I don't wear a mask then, but it doesn't, it doesn't, I don't feel limited. I just feel respectful. There are restaurants around, I'm on Martha's Vineyard that say, you need a jacket in the old days. I don't know what it is now with this, to sit here, it's a real fancy place. You need a jacket to come in and have dinner. I don't go in there and without a shirt, and throw a fit. I, if I wanna eat at the Charlotte or the Le I wear a jacket. Or I get a pizza and I wear, my sandals, right? So I try to be respectful of the environment I'm in. I've been in mosques and I pray the way they ask, the way they do. I've been in houses where they say, take your shoes off at the door. 
I do. I don't, right. everything is not on a front to my ego. I could make it that, or I could just flow like water and make friends. So, and I'm doing great. I mean, there are days I felt the COVID blues the other day, just I miss hugging people. And I was going to ask you that uh, because, you know, I was thinking of this because as, as far as I know, I was, <laughs> I was actually listening to one of your podcasts with the relationship woman. Uh, it was a couple of weeks ago. And because you wonder which one was it the intuitive psychic woman from England, Lord Day, or there's so many we we've had so many. There's just like so much. I know why I can't remember either. So you're off the hook. So we're talking about relationships because, and and I know, and I know from what I can tell, you're single, right? And yes, yes. And if any, I'm I'm I would love to have a conscious partnership with a a conscious woman. That's so I'm bringing one thing like on my landscape that is not in my picture right now that I would love to add among other things, but that would be a big one. Yeah. So I'm bringing this up because, you know, a lot, a lot, the reason this, this whole podcast actually not podcast, this uh, Tuesday talk series was created uh, is because I have been assistant to the seniors at the J for 17 years. And I thought I I know them and they're at home. Like basically most of them, you know, are at home unless they're going out now with their masks here and there. But basically a lot of them are afraid to leave their homes for good reason. Um, and their, and their medical issues. So there are a lot of them are alone and dealing with loneliness. Mm -hmm. And, um, so, and you being a single person, I mean, right now, my, I have a son and I, and as far as I know, you don't have children unless there are some that you don't no, know. I don't. Okay. None that I know of. Yeah, no, I, I don't have any. I don't, I know, I know you enough to know that you don't have any conscious children running around. I don't have any conscious children. <laughs> I mean, and if no, you did have a child, happen. they would be conscious. Yeah. <laughs> but, all right. that to say, um, so I have my son here. So I'm not really dealing with the fact that I'm single and, you know, I have somebody in the house and we're, we're, we're best friends in so many ways. I'm so fortunate. Um, so I think about that. How about if he wasn't here? Like I have a friend who lives a few doors down, she's single. And um, it's a very different time to be single and, you know, to navigate that as well. So I'm curious as you go back and forth between, you know, where you live and, and you said you want a sailboat, but you're with people. So how are you doing that safely? And how are you navigating even having encounters with people and meeting people in a way that, you know, how do you do that now, right now? What's that look like? Great question. Well, if dating was hard before COVID, oh my God, <laughs> it's about, about impossible. Lots of great conversations around the world with people. And I, and like today on the sailboat, uh, there was three of us. I've never washed my hands more than I have in the last six months. We're out in the open air. Both of those people who I had dinner with the other night recently got tested. They don't have it. I've gotten tested. I didn't have it as of a week or two ago. Um, very careful. And adaptation. That was Charles Darwin's great thing, not survival of the fittest. The ones who adapt are the ones that went on. So yesterday morning, a dear friend called me up from Washington, D.C., who lives here, and he's out walking the woods. I live in the woods in a cabin. He said, I'm not far so he came over, we sat outside in the brilliant sunshine about 10 feet apart. I gave him a cup of coffee after I washed my hands. We had a wonderful conversation. Later in the day, I went up to see a family that was visiting from Boston who I've known forever. We sat outside, we had a wonderful conversation. I'm not doing inside dining. I don't, that's, that's one of my great big sacrifices. The other night I was invited to a clam bake and then the torrential rains came and they said, oh, we're just going to move it inside. And I took a little rain check. I didn't need to, I didn't want to be inside with 70 people. Yeah. I'm not afraid, first and foremost, I'm not afraid to die. And this might be one of those last videos. The great irony, I, I think it'll be quite wonderful based didn't on- did Gladys Morissette write a song about the irony of it all? <laughs> the whole thing's a dream. Now- Pocket song. And even though I'm not afraid to die, I absolutely love being alive. So I just want to not live in fear of living and I don't, I'm not afraid of dying, but there's a middle ground and I want to, again, be respectful. Uh, like I swim a lot. I was at the beach early this morning. And if they said there were great white sharks out there this week, I might take that week off from swimming. The odds of being eaten by a shark are higher than winning the lottery in the Powerball. That said, 
they probably would go up a lot if I was out there swimming with great white sharks. So it's always, you know, I don't ride the bike at night unless I had a light on. You know, it's a, a million little things that are just respectful of how temporary and fragile we are. And I have looked at this time as an incubation period to go deep within. And I have a podcast called What Matters Most and, and really continually hone what matters most to me, right? A pr being present in the now, or I doesn't matter what else I do, I missed it. I was thinking about yesterday or some imaginary future that doesn't exist. Being present in the now and being loving, aware, compassionate, empathetic, and grateful. And then people, I love people. You know, I love people like you. I love open people. I'm fascinated by people because, and what a great idea to have a podcast. <laughs> where you can get all these people from all over the world, authors, presidents of countries, scientists, spiritual people, people that ran running for president like Andrew Yang and Marianne Williamson, congressmen, Nobel Peace Prize nominees and winners. You learn. I love these people, people you never heard of that are just amazing. And so you're mixing all these things into this beautiful smoothie called Paul's life, or it could be your life, the listener. So Again, one moment at a time, a uh, lot of space for miracles and magic. And because we can't really plan too much of anything. We weren't planning on COVID last year at this time or even six months ago. I thought I was going to go to Europe for April and May. I guess not, you know. Uh, so what do I have today? What's in the fridge, so to speak? What can I, what can I create? And I, I look at this as just a golden time. It's like a, a global reboot, a a national reboot and it's a personal reboot and a, a regeneration. What do I want to do moving forward with what time I have left, which could be five minutes or five years or 15 or 20. So that's, that's the big picture. And then I ask the life, God, spirit, Allah, whatever you call it, uh, Yahweh, what do you want me to do next? What is it you want me to do next? And I try to tune in and I try to say yes to life. I still identify with everything you say. I'm just going to check because I told people they can text me. The seniors have my phone number if they had any questions. I love seniors. I have a big <laughs> space in my heart. I took care of my parents the last six years of their life. I've always loved kids, old people, dogs, and chocolate. That was a big like I feel like you're the male version of me. We are very similar. We probably oh, came in on Aries. Yes. We have the same astrology. We are Aries. Yes. We are. That's right. We always got on great when we'd run into each other. We both love people. Yeah. I can't paint like you. I wish I could. You're very talented. Oh, thanks. People think painting is difficult, and it really is something that can be learned. I have to tell you, painting is a skill. It's like, it's just, it's another skill. Art. Having an artistic eye, people are born with certain gifts and talent. That maybe you can't you can't necessarily give somebody that, but you can teach people a different way of seeing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think so. Um, the, there are God-given talents, you know, um, but painting, people can learn how to paint. It's really it's a skill. It's pretty actually pretty easy. Um, so I just so I'm going to just knock I'm that. Put belief. that on the list right up here. <laughs> just letting you know. <laughs> Um, so I did have another question because, Go ahead. Um, okay, at, we, at some, we have to get to Larry David because, um, we, I don't know, I just, by the way, I went to high school with one of the other creators of Seinfeld. It was another guy named David, but, uh, who had, his last name was David, but beside that, I wasn't good friends with him. Spike Lee was in my graduating class. I feel uh, like- He lives up here in the vineyard. He's a few miles from him, of course. Yeah, he's, in, wow. he's a great guy. He what is- yeah, amazing. I went to school with a lot of a lot of creative people. I went to this like experimental high school in Brooklyn. Um, but I just feel blessed by, um, you know, I said at the last podcast, like you're as good as the friends you have or so it's something you can judge a person by their friends. And I'm like, wow, they, my friends make me look so good. <laughs> the people That's I know make me look so Surround good. yourself, surround yourself with that. Yeah, so, and, and which leads into the question because you have now, what did you say, 700, 7,000, what? How many people did you, uh, podcast did you do? 700? 700, 700 shows, yeah. Oh my God. 
So are there any of those podcasts that like when you just like completely like there was there something that was like a real like game changer in terms of, you know, just took you to a whole other place that you never even saw coming or, or things that still resonate with you? Are there, what would you say? Are the, I want to go there. So take that from whatever that this question is. If it's a no, question. not really. No. I'm always kidding. <laughs> Wouldn't it be? It's so funny to get a great question like that and then just get a complete dead end answer. Hey, I'm okay. I'll start asking you about the dishes behind you. That, that's I, what I actually like your decorating. I wanted to say that out loud. My but what? Your decorating skills are fabulous. Oh, thanks. That, yeah. I actually I did that painting. I liked it. I figured. All right. So there was no one like getting struck by lightning on a horse moment in the podcast. There were a lot of things uh, I got to know. Oh, I got him. He came on the show a few times and I got to meet him and know him. Chief Arvel Looking Horse of the Dakota oh, Sioux. Yeah, and he is the la last, perhaps the last of the white uh, uh, buffalo calf keeper. And one of the, he just was so deep. Uh, it was a miracle how it came about, how he got on the show. There was some higher forces and just his depth and like the wisdom, the ancient wisdom of the earth through him. That was a, a powerful moment early on. It's actually his birthday today, David McCullough, the great author, two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, lives in Martha's Vineyard too. I knew him, I used to play the piano at a hotel here. He'd come up and sing his heart out. And I ran into him right after I had the test pressing of Hitchhiking with Larry David, the book, and we'll get to that in a bit. And he thought I was still a piano player. And he asked me what was up. I handed him the book. And that's a whole bunch of other stories. But when I saw him up here right after I started the podcast and about nine people listened at that point, and he said, oh, that's fascinating. He said, you know, I'd love to be on if you ever want me to. And I was like, you, you're better than that. But I had him on anyway. He's been on at least 10 times. He was 4th of July show uh, a couple of days ago. But so these giants came on and that made the other people think it was like some really big deal. Even though I started it kind of as it had fake sponsors that were funny commercials. Garrison Keillor has been on. He actually listened and loved the show. And his publicist reached out and said, Garrison Keillor loves your show, would love to come on. He's not pitching anything. He would just love to come on. And I thought it was a friend maybe putting me on, you know, like, really, Garrison Keeler? Who is this? And they're like, uh, you can call me. I'm at Publicist in Los Angeles. I'm like, oh, sorry. You know? But, uh, and then Richard Rohr, God bless him, uh, who that great Franciscan friar who's written all those books, um, a real Joseph Campbell type figure. Wow. Very early on came, I wrote him a note, I read some one of his books and I thought I'd love to have him on. It's a million to one, but I felt inspired. I wrote him a note through a website and I was shocked. He wrote back and he said, Oh, I'm very flattered. Yeah. Maybe in the next few months. And I said, Oh, thank you just for writing back the next day. It was right before Christmas. He said, you know, I have time tomorrow on Christmas Eve if you're free. So I thought, what? <laughs> so it became the Richard Rohr Christmas show. Oh my God. <laughs> And then it came on the next year at Christmas, too. It became the second <laughs> annual. And then I was berating him in the second show, saying, what are you doing here? You're better than this. You shouldn't be on my <laughs> He was laughing. And then because of those giants, a lot of other people, I, I, I met Marianne Williamson in Los Angeles when I was working as a film producer. She was running for Congress. I was so impressed by her. Of course, I'd read Return to Love, yeah. so many other of her books. And we kind of got friendly and I supported her run. And I kept hearing that inner voice, which guides me on everything, say, you should ask Marianne to come on. And I was like, are you kidding? Like with the other people, she's huge. She probably doesn't even remember me, but I still had her number. And so I sent her a picture of us, just, uh, you may not remember. She's like, Paul, where have you been? Oh, I'd love to come on. What, what, what about later? It's like scrambling. And Marianne's been on like 20 times. I think she's going to be on the next day or two. Oh, great. Yeah, she's just a force. And what a gentle genius. And just gives, gives, gives. So there are so many shows. Irvin Laszlo has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize more times than, well, more times than me. And, <laughs> and then I could count. He came on. Somehow he had found out about the show. And now it's just a lot of the publishers and publicists. Um, 
sometimes we branched out into documentaries. Leonardo DiCaprio's company did a great uh, movie called Ice on Fire about the environment. Oh. I've had most of the top climate scientists on, like Michael Mann, Catherine Hayhoe, Peter Kamal, you know, and these folks. And once you get somebody and they realize it's a great portal to share all over the world as the audience keeps growing and that my intention is to lift up the guests. That's my one goal with the show is that the guests had a great experience and felt heard. And oftentimes they end up sharing things they never have. I recently had Jack Canfield on 75 years old who wrote, started the chicken soup of the soul series. Yeah, that is amazing. So near the end of the show, just from, in, I don't know what it was about instinct. I asked him, are you afraid of your mortality? And he paused and he, he's thinking, and then he said, you know, not at all, you know, cause I have past life memories. And I was like, what? And so he started talking about all these very vivid past life reincarnation experiences he had. So he was fearless and he's, and then he even said, I've never talked about this in 75 years. And, but it was so freeing for him because he wrote me afterward and said, all these wonderful things like he was able to be himself and he says i don't know how he ended up there so to answer your question very long answer it's not been any one lightning strike as much as uh, a million raindrops you know the mississippi yeah. starts with a single drop of rain and like a stone in a river you'll appreciate this as an artist it might have a lot of jagged edges it's in the river and over maybe a million years it is molded and sculpted by the water and the currents and the sand. And in a way, I feel like that's my soul now that I sit here and think about it, that uh, throughout time and space and in this life, I'm constantly being molded and sculpted by my experience and even this moment. So it's just going with it rather than fighting the current. Mm, that's a beautiful sentiment. Thank you. I, and, I, um, and it occurred to me while you were speaking. So, you know, when I realized like, oh, I'm not in the moment, I'm thinking something um, that to our listeners now, you can go, they, everybody can go to listen to all these podcasts and really <clears throat> all the raindrops, you know, get your, um, you don't, you don't know umbrella, get your bowl and fill there it up. No. Yeah. Come with an open hand, so open yeah. hands. Open hands, What right. is the difference between a fist and an open hand? Who's right. the life with an open hand and heart? And you'll have a whole different experience than a closed heart and fist. I think, yeah, I agree with you. You know, though, I have to say, I feel like sometimes maybe I'm wrong. Like this is going to have to be my deep thought. Like, I'm going to have to think about this one, but sometimes I, my initial response was, you know, sometimes you need a fist. Um, sometimes you need a fist. But what do you think about that? Sometimes you do. Yeah, I, right? Sometimes I you do. That's the great thing about polarity. And we live in a universe, not just on a planet full of polarity and contrast. So I feel like it's this infinite buffet of experiences and emotions. And we're kind of sitting here with our open hands or our tray. And we can kind of have the experience we want. If I want to find all kinds of bad things, all I got to do is turn on the TV and watch the news. I don't have a television and I don't watch the news. The same reason I don't drink arsenic every day. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it, polarity will find you and, but more often than not, you don't need a fist. I wouldn't go to a fist first. Sometimes it's just easier to yield or to say something softly or suggest it. Right now, that seems to be getting harder and harder. You know, people are just going a little nuts. But I feel like in, in an ideal world. We don't have to be that way, Carrie. We don't right. have to. But yeah, I would never no. tell you to not defend what you feel. Yeah, no, no, I was just, it was, it was a thought because I feel like sometimes, sometimes the world is so hard and you think the only way I'm going to get through is just to just like, I have to like fight my way through it. But, you know, I personally don't, I personally am more inclined to my belief system to, is more towards what you're describing and, and having an open hand and, and yielding and, you know, just letting things unfold and all of that but I also feel like I you know it's, it's weird to say I, I mean I I work really hard and I, my life has not been an easy one my story is not an easy one mm 
Um, and I've always chosen not to use the fist. As a matter of fact, I remember when I was a kid, somebody actually, this kid came up, he was a bully or something. He bashed my head against a brick wall, I remember. But I didn't fight back. It wasn't, my, it wasn't even my inclination to fight mm. back. I've never had that inclination in that way to fight back. I think I found my expression through art and being creative is my way of giving voice to whatever, you know, and, mm. and that's kind of, I want to say fighting my way through, but it's kind of, it's like the path I've chosen to um, find my way through life. It's been my saving grace is create being a creative person. And that, that has led me down a whole different path than fighting back. And, and so, but I look at the world right now and I think, you know, people have said to me, oh, the protesters and they're, um, you know, they're, they're destroying. And somehow I understand that anger, you know, I understand that I understand it. I don't know that it's, you know, I'm not, without right or wrong, I understand when things are so hard, when things are, when someone is suffering so much, when that welling comes, becomes so, you know, great, um, that sometimes that expression just, it, it is what it is. I hate that expression, but, you know, <laughs> so, um, I don't know. I feel like maybe I'm getting off base because I want to come back to Larry Day. <laughs> You really want to Jones that Larry David thing. So let's go. All right, ask me some Larry David questions. Go to Larry David. But it, there is polarity in life and it and it is all things. And yeah. nature is violent and nature is is as soft and beautiful and yielding at the same time. And um, I just wish that human nature could be more elevated and mindful, mindful and people can like Carl Jung says, you know, the whole dark shadow, that whole part of ourselves, until we look at it and face it and look at it straight on and incorporate it into us and as a whole, it, we, don't have to, we don't have to live through that dark, we don't have to live that out if we incorporate it into ourselves. And that's what makes the whole of us. It's not like people don't have dark thoughts or don't have, you know, um, violent thoughts. Everybody human, you, I mean, I felt like, oh my God, I just want to kill somebody. You know, I mean, that's a dark thought, but do I kill somebody? No, but I have the thought and I incorporate, oh, cause I'm angry and you know, blah, 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 and go. And then I incorporate it into my being. Um, when it's not incorporated, it explodes. So, and that's maybe a whole other conversation. Um, <laughs> And, and, and with all the people that you've interviewed, I mean, how do you, how do you find, like, is with you, would you say wisdom comes through, what is your take on the, on wisdom before we go to Larry David? Cause we're going to get to Larry David, but Good. Yeah. it's like coming attractions. We're going to get to Larry David before the <laughs> listeners are waiting. Stay tuned. You got to listen to all this. And, we and then if we tonight. never do, that would be funny. You have to tune in again next time. I would love to from back. today. This is part one. Um, this is part one. Wisdom. I mean, you have, after, and maybe you touched on this already, because you, you know, I asked you from all the people that you interviewed, but these people, some people just acquire wisdom. How, how, how have you, do you feel wise in any ways that maybe you weren't in your early years? And do you think it's just life itself? Or do you think, um, you know, how do you acquire wisdom? That's a good question. I think uh, there's there's as many ways to, to acquire wisdom as there are people in the world, you know? Uh, I love people. I love experience. I love to read. I love to learn. I love to ask questions. And usually, unfortunately for the human race and me personally, a lot of times we we do it the hard way. You know, who hasn't seen a toddler? Don't put your hand on that hot stove. Or remember as a kid sticking the screwdriver in the plug, going <laughs> flying. That explains a lot later, doesn't it? So I think that's it. You just And I think being open and not... One of the greatest ways to acquire wisdom is to think you don't know anything. Because when you feel like you know everything what can you learn a closed mind you know it's, it's a dilapidated old building there yeah, really so i think just stay eternally curious and truth is constantly evolving and so am i and so is life so there is no definitive of this is the one true way that's why i've never been religious because there's this infinite mystery and in spirituality and then to try to codify it in old books that then get edited a million times and reprinted in South Korea, 
it just feels like that's like dead, like dead flesh that life is alive in the moment. There's a burning edge between the past and the future. And if you can live in that flame right there on the edge, which is terrifying and fleeting, but it's alive, it's alive. Stay in that space and don't seek refuge in old sayings. Some of it's true. I mean, there's truth in everything, but if you could stay here and just be true to thine own self, like Shakespeare said, and staying with a loving open heart i think you're going to have with good boundaries sometimes you might need to have that uh so and you were talking about the shadow james baldwin one of my literary heroes and heroes in general he wrote uh, the great quote that which cannot be faced can never be healed right. and in our country 400 plus years of racism misogyny uh, we stole the country from the Native Americans, which I was just thinking about that in meditation last night, that a couple hundred years ago, the whole continent was covered with these beautiful people that had been here hundreds of thousands of years. And I mentioned Chief Arvaral Looking Horse just a little a few minutes ago. And here they were living in harmony with the land as human beings. And then now it's overrun by this foreign people today, and these poor souls live in squalid places in great poverty. I, I think it's not too late to make it right. And I would say the same thing about slavery. I'm all about reparations and not just dropping money from planes and over the great plains or in inner cities. I think we could be really focused and calculated, but I think the this time of massive transformation and potential extinction, which not to beat around the bush, no big deal for the earth and, and the billions of species that might sing the greatest rejoicing choir of gratitude heard in this galaxy, if uh, the white virus or the virus of humanity were to be subdued. But not to be negative, I see that all as an, an opportunity, an opportunity to create a new world. You know, that's what I wanna be a part of with what few breaths I might have left, even if there are thousands or millions of them. I wanna be part of this new world that's waiting to be born. We have more than enough. We have enough technology. We have infinite energy. We figured out the green thing. We don't have to poison the rivers. There's more than enough for everybody to live a decent life. And why not then? I don't see the point in suffering because of ideas or the fact that we have this limitation and limited thinking. And it's not gonna happen overnight. It's not gonna happen painlessly, but it can happen. I believe in the possibility of it. Will it happen? That's a great mystery. It's like a great movie. I don't wanna know how it ends. It, I'd leave early because I already knew, but I'd like to be a part. And I would like to invite everyone else who's listening who might hear this someday. Uh, even from another civilization studying why we went away, at least you'll say, there was that one strange guy who spoke something about it, that we have an opportunity here today and tomorrow to create a better world. And really what else would I, could I use my privilege and my profoundly gifted life for? You know, in my early years, it was all about me and getting a good tan or playing music or trying to achieve to prove something. And then I guess I made it, whatever that means, a thousand years from now, no one will know. But now I'd like to use this part of what's left to maybe be a part of this new world that's waiting to be born. And I'm glad that I kind of came to this just yakking with you today. Um, that's the beauty of dialogue and conversations and stuff like that. So let's do it. Uh, was who was a uh, I know Robert Kennedy said it, but he might have been quoting George Bernard Shaw or someone who said, "Some people look at what is and wonder why, and other people look at what isn't and wonder why not." And I think I'm in both camps, mm -hmm. but I think it's time. I think it's time that we took care of the least and lifted people up and lifted women up and lifted 
minorities up and we have to do something about our racism and history. You got to be taught to hate like that great song in South Pacific. It's not inbred. It's not born into us. So, you know, maybe we, the next hundred years, if we're fortunate enough to be on the planet, that could be the great awakening. So how's that for an answer? That's a great, that's, that's the answer. And I made, it made me think of if not now, when? Yes. I mean, if that's how not I me. Thinking. And if not me, who? Who? And then that's, if not, why not? Exactly. Right. 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 If not I mean, you or me, then who and why not? That's how I live my life. I always say, how can I make this world a better place? What can I do? And I, and when I was pregnant, I remember praying every day to God. And I just said, please, God, like whoever you bring this world, if I can ask for something, let it be somebody who makes this world a better place. And so, you know, and I feel blessed to have a son who I think is a really sensitive, intelligent, caring, loving being. And um, because really I look at the children and I think, you know, this is their world. And, um, and you know, and I hope that they're, they're going to be good stewards, you know, and, and be able to correct a lot of the, you know, decisions that were unfortunate that our generation and the ones before us has, you know, created. Yeah. Less conscious. Yeah, exactly. Well, maybe it could be a little more conscious. It seems like it's going in that direction. Actually, I kind of, in the whole darkness of this pandemic, if you, if you want to see, if I do see it, it's darkness sometimes maybe, but I actually do feel more hopeful in this whole time of uprising. I actually, I mean, I have feel like an excitement, like of now, like, it's happening, like all people are coming together and realizing, you know, I feel like I'm just watching like people joining hands, you know, literally and figuratively, like we've got to help each other, like in ways that we've never done before. And um, I, and I feel that more than ever. So I, I feel really hopeful for this time actually. And this time, you know, of having pushed everybody into back into their houses to give, well, not everybody, the essential workers, unfortunately, and thank God for them. And also to, to bring light on who our work, who, who we really do rely on. I mean, it's just been an incredible time to see what's really going on. I mean, I, I feel like there's a lot of light coming in actually. Um, so is Larry David really funny? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> is, like, is that a rhetorical question? <laughs> Is he like, is it, is this a curmudgeon? Is that a curmudgeon self? Is that, is that really like, that's who he is, right? I can't imagine him being anything else but that. And, and I hope he doesn't mind that I'm asking about him and talking about him. But I'm just curious because, you know, when you meet people who you just kind of envision some way and he cracks me up, I mean, just seeing him, I start laughing. Did like when he picked you up, well, did you start laughing? <laughs> no, no, I was shocked that it happened. It's a true story. It happened to Martha's Vineyard. I was trying to get over a girl. I wrote a book about it called I Hitchhiker. Remember Beth. I remember Beth. I met her. <laughs> oh, I love Beth forever. God, I love Beth forever. That's right. You, she loved you. You, you like loved her back in Nashville. And he picked me up and he is an incredible guy. What's great about the book is you see so many sides to him. He's not the character on Kirby Enthusiasm, which is the best show. I love that one. <laughs> it's genius. He's a genius. Seinfeld, I don't throw the term around a lot, loosely. But the guy has a very unique brand, but he's also a deep thinker. He's very political. He's very progressive. He's pro-environment. He's dry. He's funny. He's extremely sensitive. He's been kind to me. He endorsed the book. Thank you, Larry. Hopefully you won't be watching this. You've got something to do. He plays good golf. He's generous. He's a good father to his two daughters. Uh, Larry's a mensch. Since I'm on with the JCC crowd, Larry's a real mensch. And he was a mensch to me. He's been a mensch to me. And he's a beautiful guy. And the book is really about him, and he and I, the actual ride, the conversation we had. You'll see a lot more depth from him than he's ever shown. That's why I like the book. He's had a lot of people come up to him and say nice things because he's portrayed beautifully in the book. It's a love letter uh, to life, that book. That book has a magic to it. I have written six or I don't know how many, but it, and but that one is something about that little book. I still get notes every week. It's, I don't know how that happened. It was a beautiful experience. 
Thank you to everyone who read it, who might be listening. I read it. it was the universe saying yes to you. It gave you, it gave It really you was, well said. Yeah. I stuck my thumb out, which is a universal symbol of possibilities. And the universe said, how about this? And I was like, wow, okay. Now, when he picked me up, I wasn't thinking, oh, here's my break, a famous <laughs> life form. I'm gonna write a book, I'm gonna take notes. I was just trying to get some clarity in my life. And it's a love letter to Martha's Vineyard, which has always been a special place where I am right now in Ireland. And also to my parents, to the mystery of life and our being. It's such a mystery, isn't it? I mean, where do we come from? We come in for a brief moment, where do we go? It's just beyond my little capacity and anyone that's ever been here. But somehow it happens as we hurtle through space on a giant magnet, sun. I mean, it's all just so incredible. So why bog down with a lot of bullshit if you don't mind my French? But sometimes you do have to shovel some stuff and clean out the, clear out the stables, the barn. Larry again. But the Larry is just fabulous. And what amazed me with that book, Carrie, is I never thought anyone would read it. <laughs> and it was so honest and open. As you know, you read it. I like poured my soul into it. And it wasn't until the night before it came out that I thought, oh my God, what have I done? I like woke up in a startle. And then I thought, ah, no one will read this. <laughs> we went right back to sleep. And it has become, it sells more every year than the year before. It's a cult classic. So and then once I put it out there, there's no mystery about me anymore. It's all there. But that was a guy that's like 10 years or 12 years ago. It's almost like now while I'm still technically that being, I always will be. It's almost like, oh, I remember when I wrote a book when I was a caterpillar called Hitchhiking with Larry David. And now I'm a butterfly remembering with great fondness and nostalgia and sentimental. Yes, I used to crawl around on the ground and eat leaves and try to avoid the bird droppings. But now I have these wings and I fly and I do all this stuff. And to any of the caterpillars out there, it's wonderful. So don't be afraid to transform yourself because life is nothing but change. Be the change you wish to see, Gandhi said it, and embrace it, go with it. You could fight it, but that's not gonna work either. Go with the current, it delights in lifting you up and nothing can really happen to you anyway because whatever came in essence and whatever goes out is eternal and untouched by time and space but it can have experiences. So that's so, my yeah. bit of, that's my bit of hitchhiker's wisdom here. That's, go read the book, everybody. That's all I'm gonna say about that. You, the book is, where can they get the book? It's on Amazon. Okay. If you go to paulsamueldolman.com, my website's there. But if you just Google hitchhiking with Larry David, uh, that's everywhere. And also the webs, uh, the podcast is on paulsamueldolman.com and also on iTunes and all kinds of other platforms. So before we wrap up, there's two things. First of all, um, I wanna ask you a question and I just wanna, I have to, there's one more thing and then we'll wrap up. But um, before we went live, you were speaking about your dad and, yes. if we, and then we went live cause like, oh my God, it's time to go live. And we just jumped into live. And you was talking about how your dad, and, and I think this ties into what you just said, how we're all energy and we come into this world, we go out of this world, we're just energy transforming all along the way. Um, and you said your dad has, um, you feel like he's around you and you were gonna tell me in what way. So I'm kind of curious what, how is that manifesting? Oh, I love, I love talking about my dad. I could do any show about that. So two years ago on Father's Day, my dad transitioned out of his body, just shy of 94. My best friend, my mentor, I had the greatest dad ever, a Brooklyn boy, like a person like you. Grew up loving those Dodgers a few blocks from Ebbets Field when there was an Ebbets Field. So when dad decided he was leaving, he started to just like, he put down the mask of being Harold Dolman and was this eternal self who never had believed in anything like that. So he starts talking like an avatar, not babbling with the eyes up in the head, like a Brooklyn boy who's totally present, who could see guys that had been killed in World War II with him, spiritual teachers. He knew the eternity of everything. And yet there he was. And it was just as matter of fact as if somebody in, Bro you know, a tree grows in Brooklyn, a guru <laughs> grows in Brooklyn. <laughs> 
And so we had this unbelievable last week or so until his last breath and God bless him. But after that, I started, I was meditating here, felt him. It was like the first week after and crying just like, cause it was my best friend. And I opened my eyes and a white feather was floating down into my lap inside a house. So of course the linear person starts looking for a giant white bird. There was no giant white bird. And I still have that feather up on my wow. mantle, my meditation mantle. And then I started finding feathers in cars with the windows. And so did my friends, the white feather, the white feather. That was one aspect that he came back. There were a lot of other stories. You'd smell old spice, which he wore in a house, my house. I'd come home and they'd old spice. Oh, dad, dad, I love dad. The way he comes the most, and now with my mother, because she she went with him on December 7th, I held her hand and handed her off to my father. And I said, go down the beach. They met at Far Rockaway Beach in New York. Oh my God. 1947. And I had thought two nights earlier, I had dinner with her and she was great. And I thought, what a shame. They were together 71 years that they had to be apart even for a minute. And within 48 hours, she, she joined him. So what that happens is at night when we sleep, which is mysterious and we have dreams and I have dreams but there's, I've been having these altered states that are occurring while I sleep that are so different than dreams. And in them, I interact with my parents and my dad a lot. And they're as real as this. And sometimes I remember early on, I woke up completely confused about which reality I was real. So I said, God, which one's real? And I heard the universe answer both. Like different floors on an apartment complex or at a giant tower and so I interact with him there and I meet him and my mom and I have dinner the other night I was with them and it was so real like this and then I said to him we were at dining and I said god I had the saddest dream ever dad and and he's like what and he said that you had died it's so weird and then he said well I on earth I'm gone and I said oh, that's right, I'm in this state. And I started to weep. I was so sad about back there and it woke me up. So there's just a ton, there are a ton of clues. And he said before he left, remember, never spiritual. He said, I'll be with you always, I always have been. We've never been apart and we never will be. And not as these forms with the essence. And then he said, when you leave your form, I will be there as you have for me, on and on and on. And it's comforting. Now, all of that said, I still miss him like crazy and my mom. And that's part of being a human being because we're trapped, semi-trapped here in time and space. And our souls want to experience temporality and loss and not knowing and attachment and grief and all, every single thing in between. So, it succeeded wildly because I love my father and my mother so much and I do miss them a lot. So I'm holding both feelings, but I fear not that we will be separate because we're not now. And I realize at some point when I'm with him and my mother and God only knows who and what else, and I'll be within the infinite love that I've experienced I won't have to wake up into this world that I'll just stay there. And I have obviously no fear, sadness, or, or regret about that moment. I feel like that'll be the greatest moment, the greatest awakening of my mortal life. Mm. In the meantime, given this form, I'm, I just want to cherish that I got to be here today with you and whoever hears this and that I don't know what the next 10 minutes holds, but I'm curious. Well, hold that thought. Okay. Anyway, I'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. <sighs> One second. I don't know. I have this thing about full circleness, right? at least for today, full circle. Although this was part one, but part one of full circle, full circle of part one today, 
I want to thank you so much. I mean, this was like, a, this was joyous to me and it was so comforting and so insightful. And I just, I just feel very fulfilled by speaking with you. So yeah. thank you. And yeah. I hope everybody who's listening does so as well. And I just want to give you a virtual offering of a chocolate chip cookie. Oh, the perfect thing. And you know what's good about this? I don't need any more calories, but that's about <laughs> as close as a chocolate chip cookie I should be. The best cookie there is, a virtual cookie. And with that, sending you lots of love. Shalom. Shalom. Uh, whatever. <laughs> Namaste. <laughs> Blessings. But you Good know, you. Thank you, you Karen. Thank you. And, we, and I look forward to part two. Lots of love to everybody and you especially. Thank, Thank you, Karen. God bless you Thank all. Thank you so much, Paul. See you soon.